Welcome to Conversations. This summer at Community, we're going to spend three weekends exploring some tough topics. Refugees, sexuality and spirituality, and racism. Today you'll get a chance to hear from one of the foremost thought leaders on a topic that can be polarizing in our current culture. Our goal with today's big idea is to model how to have a conversation about this topic by hearing our expert story and looking to the Bible as our truth source. It's our hope that this conversation will inspire all of us as we seek to understand the many facets of this tough topic so that we can draw closer to God and seek ways to help others find their way back to Him. So with that in mind, let's begin the conversation. Matt Soren serves as the U.S. Director of Church Mobilization for World Relief, an organization seeking to empower the local church to bring peace, justice, and love to a broken world. Matt co-wrote Seeking Refuge on the shores of the global refugee crisis and Welcoming the Stranger, Justice, Compassion, and Truth in the Immigration Debate. Originally from Nina, Wisconsin, Matt now lives in Aurora, Illinois and attends community's Aurora location. Matt, I want to say thanks very much for uh, having this conversation. And to let everybody know, um, you are the Director of Church Mobilization for World Relief. Um, you're also an award-winning author, and you probably wouldn't toot your own horn, but really, I mean, a uh, thought leader both nationally and globally on, on this particular topic. Why is this such a tough conversation? What are some of the factors that make this a hard thing for us to talk about these days? Yeah, I think as we think about this refugee crisis, it generates a lot of emotions for, for a lot of Americans, for a lot of Christians. And part of that is, you know, it's the images we see on television and the media. I think back to the image probably about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, of a little boy washed ashore on a beach in Turkey, Alan Kurdi, three years old. And I think probably everyone knows the image I'm describing because it was everywhere on Facebook and in the newspaper. And I can't help but look at that image and have a range of emotions. I mean, I look at that little boy and my heart just breaks. I think about my two-year-old son, Zephaniah, who looks when he's sleeping a lot like that, wearing little Velcro shoes like that. And I think about the boy's father. And you can't help but have a sense of compassion. I think most people feel that, certainly followers of Christ. But at the same time, and almost even subconsciously, I begin to think about what on earth is that father running away from? What sort of horror is behind them that getting on that boat, trying to flee the Civil War, seems like the most reasonable option? And I can't help but feel a sense of fear as well. Um, how do we keep whatever they're running away from from coming here to my son, to my daughter, to, from, to my family? So I think those competing polar emotions of compassion on one side but also some fear on the other are in many ways what are guiding the American response to this refugee crisis and the response even within the church. With those kind of images and both the kind of compassion but also that kind of fear there, how, how do we actually have like an honest kind of civil conversation about something that's so politically polarizing? Yeah, I think for me the most important thing for Christ followers is that we keep our conversation grounded and rooted in what does the Bible say? What, does the scriptures, what do the scriptures tell us that can inform how we would respond to a, a very complex issue? And then secondarily, what are the facts? Because in, we're in a society where you can find whatever you'd like to believe somewhere on the internet, but it turns out not everything on the internet is true. Um, and so really looking at what are the hard facts and what's happening here. And then finally, just remember that ultimately we're talking about people, that these are people who are made by God with inherent dignity and value and that each one has an individual story. We can't look at them all the same. And to be able to have those stories in our mind of who this actually impacts, as well as the facts and of course most of all the scriptures themselves. How did you first get exposed to the issues kind of in involving refugees and really where, I mean, I think God really kind of, kind of maybe uh, kind of out of left field a little bit, kind of all of a sudden gave you a burden for, for this people yeah. group? I grew up in northeastern Wisconsin, pretty small town. If there were refugees there, I was not aware of it. And it wasn't necessarily something I cared about. And if anything, maybe something I found a little bit, you know, that made me a little bit afraid. Came down here to the Chicago area to go to school at Wheaton College. And my senior year at Wheaton, there was a classmate of mine who made this announcement in class. She had been volunteering with this organization, World Relief, to help this Rwandan refugee family. And she said, you know, they've got four daughters and I've connected really well with the girls, but they also have this 13-year-old son and I feel like he'd really benefit from a guy who would just mentor him. And I thought at the time, you know, I have the reputation for behaving like a 13-year-old. I could actually be really good at this. Um, so I said, sure, I could do that. 
as this young man, Dennis, who was 13 at the time, he's now finishing college, uh, became a good friend of mine in some ways. And his family, his parents, his sisters became friends of mine. And I started to learn about what it was to be a refugee, uh, why people had had to flee their countries, the persecution that they had faced. And really also to see, in their case in particular, the faith that had sustained them. Uh, I think that sometimes we forget that a lot of the refugees coming to the United States are already believers. They're followers of Jesus. And so this was just a remarkable family. And they became such good friends that a semester later I finished college and I had to figure out where to live. So I moved into the neighborhood. I then had neighbors from about 20 different countries of origin. And most of them refugees, some other immigrants as well. Uh, but it, for me, this issue of refugees was no longer about numbers or legal definitions or policies. It was about people. It was about my friends from Rwanda and from Burma and from Bhutan and from Iran and from various other countries around the world who had been forced to flee their countries because of persecution and in God's providence ended up here in suburban Chicago and became my neighbors in a very literal sense. And for me that just put the whole issue in a different lens and I became really passionate about both the situation of refugees here, but also about the global dynamic of, of refugees. Let's uh, kind of talk about what we see kind of the Bible has to say. One of the things I ran across, um, I think it was a 2015 LifeWay research survey that uh, says only about 12% of American Christians uh, said when they think about immigration issues, they primarily see it from a biblical perspective. I think when an issue like this becomes such a, you know, again, political, economic, cultural hot button for us, it's easy just for it to get, get caught up in kind of the whole public discourse, flip from channel to channel, and feel like our opinions get ping pong back and forth. But why don't you start us off with what God's Word has to say with that? And particularly, let's, let's I know you, because you've done a lot of work. I love your first book, Welcoming the Stranger. Let's start with um, in the Old Testament, what the Old Testament has to say about this whole topic. I mean, I would start with the Old Testament with the very beginning, and okay. I already alluded to this idea, but that every person in Genesis chapter one, we're told is made in the image of God. Uh, male and female, God created them in his image. And what that means is that every human person, without any qualifier of what country they're from or their language or their religion or anything we could add to that, has inherent human dignity, that their lives are valuable to God. And because they're made in the image of the creator God, that they have inherent potential as well. So I, I think it's important to start there just because often we talk about refugees and we think about these big groups of people and we talk about them um, as if they're a burden. And, and we might even use that language, you know, is this country is bearing the weight of the burden of the refugee crisis. But I don't think that any person who's made in God ima God's image is a burden. So I think that's just a good place to start remembering that image of God within each person. And then a, a second theme that we find throughout the Old Testament, and you find this really throughout the whole way through is that God has this particular concern for the vulnerable. And there's three groups of people who we often find highlighted as uniquely vulnerable. Um, it's the orphan, the widow, and the foreigner, or the stranger, the sojourner, the immigrant, depending upon your translation of the Bible into English. In fact, that word for a foreigner, it's the Hebrew word ger. That word alone appears 92 times in the Old Testament. So this is not just like a few verses, it's actually a pretty consistent theme. And it's rooted in the, the character of God. Um, so, for example, in Deuteronomy 10, verses 17 through 19, it says, The Lord your God is the God of all gods, the great and mighty God, who does not play favorites and does not take bribes. He enacts justice for the orphan and the widow, and he loves the foreigner residing among you, hmm. providing them with food and clothing. And then if that wasn't clear enough, it says, Therefore you must also love foreigners. Like, this is God's personality, this is God's character, and this is how to be your character as well. We see that same dynamic in Psalm 146, verse 9. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. It's part of the character of God. In Jeremiah 22, God tells the Israelites to do justice and righteousness. And then he goes on to basically define what that means. He says, do not do any harm or violence to the foreigner, the orphan, or the widow. Uh, and we could go, again, there's dozens of cases in the Old Testament where we find these three groups of people together as uniquely vulnerable, and God both expresses his love and concern for those who are vulnerable and commands his people to express that same love and concern. Even the word hospitality, when okay. we get to the New Testament, that word hospitality in the Greek of the New Testament is philoxenia. It is literally the love of strangers. So we think about hospitality as having our friends over for lunch. Right. That's a great thing to do, yeah. but it's actually not hospitality, at least in the sense of the command in, of the New Testament to love strangers. That's a pretty countercultural command. I mean, I grew up watching Saturday morning cartoons that were all about stranger danger, right? And I have children, I get why we send that message to kids, but I think maybe sometimes as adults, sometimes as a society, our response to those who are different from us, who are unknown to us, is to see a potential threat. 
And I can't promise you from the Bible that there's never a threat. But I can tell you that we're commanded over and over again to practice hospitality, as it says in Romans 12 and elsewhere. Um, for leaders in the church, it's a requirement in Timothy and, and Titus to be a lover of strangers. And when we do so, Hebrews 13 actually suggests that some people by welcoming strangers have actually entertained angels wow. without realizing it. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, you also have a number of examples of people who are displaced from sure. their homes. Yeah. Maybe a couple examples. Yeah, I mean, many of the heroes of our faith, like King David fleeing from King Saul and seeking asylum, mm -hmm. uh, or the prophet Elijah fleeing under King Ahab, this tyrannical king. And then certainly the most important refugee in the scriptures and in, in human history is Jesus himself. Explain that. Okay, so how is Jesus a refugee? Yeah, you know, I think we forget this part of the story. And I'll use an example. My daughter, Zipporah, who uh, the Aurora campus will know, she's quite adorable and I think uniquely smart. We've got a nativity set, probably like a lot of other folks, this little wooden nativity scene we got as a wedding gift. And during the month of December, Zippy just, this is her favorite toy. But she made this observation. She said, hey, Dad, we're missing a figurine. We don't have the mean king. And I thought about that. I've never seen a nativity set with a King Herod figurine. You know, that's not necessarily our favorite part of the story, but it is an important part of the story because in Matthew chapter 2, as soon as the wise men, the Magi, have gone to worship Jesus as a newborn, or as soon as they are back on their way to their country, uh, the scriptures tell us that Joseph was warned in a dream that Herod, this paranoid Middle Eastern king, was coming to kill all the little baby boys in Bethlehem. And Joseph was told to get up in the middle of the night and to escape to Egypt. No time to make a plan, no time to put all your things together. You just had to run. Mm. And we don't get a lot of details in the, in the Bible of what that journey was like. I mean, I know I have a hard time doing uh, long trips with my children in an air-conditioned vehicle, um, but this was probably not an air-conditioned vehicle and probably very long to get to Egypt from Bethlehem. We also don't know how they were treated when they got there. You know, it's very possible that they met some people who had compassion on them, who, who showed them hospitality. It's also possible that there was people who were suspicious of them, who said, you know what, we don't know what kind of diseases this kid has. Or, you know what, Joseph, we've got enough carpenters in this economy without you taking a job. Um, that's speculation, but it's interesting that Jesus can very personally identify with the roughly 65 million people in our world today who have been forcibly displaced from their homes, because that was his story as a small child. Not only, I guess, this great example, Jesus was a refugee, but he also then does some quite a bit of teaching sure. and challenges on this topic. You know, there's a couple of different teachings that Jesus does that I think are particularly relevant here. One is just the idea of what we think of as the golden rule. You know, do to others as you would have them do unto you. So I think it's incumbent upon us to think, you know, put yourselves in the shoes of a refugee. If it was me forced to flee this country, let's say, maybe because of my Christian faith, as hard as that might be to imagine right now, and I ended up some way halfway around the world in some airport in a you know, a place where I didn't know the language, I knew no one, I would so want to be welcomed by someone from a local church who would sit with me through the awkwardness of a language barrier, who would grieve with me all that had been lost, mm -hmm. and who would help me to rebuild my life. And, and frankly, that's uh, as refugees arrived in the United States, many of them actually persecuted Christians, others persecuted people from other faith backgrounds. We have the opportunity to do that. Another biblical teaching is just the idea of, of loving your neighbor as yourself. And when Jesus, uh, talks about that. He was asked actually by a, a legal scholar, a lawyer, so what's the greatest commandment? And he says it's to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the lawyer, who's a good lawyer and has a good follow-up question, well, what is the precise legal definition of a neighbor? And you get the sense, because it says in, in the Bible he wanted to justify himself, that he probably would have liked the response to have been, well, your neighbor is someone three doors down on either side of your same ethnicity and religion and language. And I suppose if that was the definition and you didn't like that person very much, you could just move. But that's not the definition that Jesus gives us. He responds with the story of, of the Good Samaritan. And it's probably worth mentioning that a Good Samaritan was an oxymoron mm. to the average Jewish listener. So because? Because the Samaritans were not good. They were ethnically different. Uh, they were foreigners. They were uh, religiously different as well. I mean, they were considered heretics. They did not worship God in the right place. They had some in misinformed belief about God. Um, nevertheless, Jesus actually makes a Samaritan the hero of the story. And I think there's a few takeaways for us as we think about this refugee crisis. One is that our neighbor is to be defined broadly, uh, that it's not as simple as the people who live in our neighborhood. Uh, though we, should, we could start there, but we can't end there. Our neighbor could be someone of just about any background who is in need. Another point that I think is worth noting is that the Samaritan put himself at some risk to love that guy beat up on the side of the road. You know, we can easily criticize the priest and the Levite 
but they were acting in a way that from a human perspective was pretty rational. You know, this is a dangerous road. You don't stop and linger in a dangerous place. You keep on going and get out of that unsafe place. Now, I think actually welcoming refugees into the United States is actually very safe, and we could talk about the, the vetting process and all that. But even if it wasn't, I would challenge us that our first command as Christians is not just to ask the question, is this safe, but also, who is my neighbor? And if this is our neighbor, whether we're talking about a refugee being resettled into Chicagoland, or a refugee fleeing Syria and landing in Jordan, or fleeing Somalia and ending up in Kenya, or wherever we're talking about in the world, that that person might be our neighbor too, and to ask the question of how do we show God's love to them. So with that kind of as a foundation, um, how do you respond to I mean, a person who says, exactly you said, well, but it is a matter of public safety, or don't we need to make sure that we take care of our own before we try to take care of the rest of the world? Because I mean, sure. that's, that's, those are very real things that we, that we feel. No, absolutely. And again, I would say, first of all, those, those concerns are very legitimate. And I think the, to the safety question, it's appropriate to expect our government to ensure the safety of U.S. citizens. I think even if you look at the way God talks about government in the New Testament, God has ordained government for a purpose, and part of that is protecting citizens. Um, so I'd affirm that. Where I think we make an error is we've, if we set it up as a false choice of we must either be secure or compassionate. When I think there's a ways, there are ways that we can do both, that we can be prudent, our government can be prudent, mm -hmm. and we can expect our government to do that and hold them accountable to that, while also making sure that we don't lose sight of our role as the church. Because in one sense, Regardless of your opinion on refugee policy, I've got strong opinions on that, but setting that aside, if refugees are showing up at the airport, if they're landing at O'Hare, wouldn't we all agree that we would want a team from a local church there to meet them at the baggage claim and to be that friendly presence to help them integrate into a new community? Um, because that's going to be better for them. They're going to integrate better. They're going to learn the language better. They're going to fit in better. We've also seen it be really transformational for local churches here. And frankly, to the extent that people are concerned about radicalization, which uh, it is appropriate to, to think about, the best antidote to that is to be welcomed by a team of American Christians. Because it's really hard to believe the ISIS rhetoric that all Americans are your enemies or all Christians are your enemies when it's a bunch of American Christians who met you at the airport, who were your, your closest friends in this country, who helped your kids get into school and helped you adjust to a new job and a new language. Um, so I would say that, you know, we, that's a great place to start, regardless of how we think about the government's role, which is an appropriate question. The second question on, well, what about, you know, we've got all these problems of our own. Again, a fair question. I think it is also important, though, as we think biblically, that we keep in mind that commandment to love our neighbor is broader than just our own, however we want to define that, Chicagoland or Illinois or the United States. We absolutely should care about vulnerable people in our own community. But I don't think we can use that as a, an excuse not to care about those who might come from a different background. I think we see, you know, Jesus himself got himself in some trouble with this sort of attitude. In Luke chapter 4, um, he goes to his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. And it's interesting because it says he, the people were amazed at his teaching. He had such gracious words. And then you skip a few verses ahead and it, they are kicking him out of his, the synagogue and trying to throw him off a cliff, literally. And you wonder, well, what did Jesus say that got him in so much trouble? Mm -hmm. Well, he told the people there in his hometown synagogue that they weren't the center of the world, that they weren't the only people God was concerned with. The idea that God loves the whole world, mm -hmm. that God loves people of every background, is not always going to jive with every part of our culture, but it is an explicitly biblical teaching. I thought, let's back up and take kind of a, a really global perspective. Um, eight years ago, you, eight or nine years ago, you wrote Welcoming the Stranger, and it sounds like you're getting ready to do a a uh, revision of that very yeah, hopefully. soon. Uh, but more recently, uh, with a couple of colleagues, you wrote uh, Seeking Refuge. And in here, you, you talk about how we are in the middle of an unprecedented global crisis. Um, maybe for those of us that aren't in the know, and you certainly are, because this is kind of, you deal in this every day, kind of describe for us what is the extent of the crisis that you see right now? I mean, I think fundamentally we're looking at an unprecedented crisis, mostly in terms of the numbers. I mean, there have always been refugees, even through the stories of scripture and all throughout world history. But at this point, there are 21.3 million refugees in the world, according to the UN's best estimates. That's individuals who fled their country because of a well-founded fear of persecution because of their race, their religion, their political opinion, their national origin, or their social group. And that doesn't include a little bit more than 40 million additional people who have fled their homes for those reasons, but are still within the boundaries of their country. Hmm. You add that up, we're talking about, about 65 million people. And I know I hear 65 million people, and my mind doesn't know what to do with that. So I think, you know, people could think about the entire population of the city of Chicago, and all of the suburbs, and the rest of the state of Illinois. Not, and then you'd have to add on Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri. 
Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, and Michigan. That's roughly 65 million people. You know, an incredible number of people. And I think one of the things you said, which again, we all have kind of a mental paradigm when we do hear these things. Am I right about this? And half of them are children? Yeah, that's right. Globally, it's just about half who are children. And unfortunately, those are some of the most vulnerable people, obviously. If you go back to Jesus' story, when you're making a dangerous journey uh, to flee from violence, you've you grab the kids and you make tough choices. What do you do when you've got two kids at home with you and one's at school, but the rebels or groups are over there and they're coming for your town? Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the refugees whom we've been able to serve here with local churches have made excruciatingly difficult decisions. And some of them have family members who didn't make it out, who didn't make it at all. Others, they made it, but they were separated. So about half the refugees that we resettle are actually family reunification cases, where one of the relatives is already here, but they're trying to be reunited with their family. Let's bring it down to the individual person who is maybe moved by what you're saying, but still feeling some fear, some intrepidation about this. How do we kind of move forward yeah. individually? Yeah, you know, I think that one of the scripture passages that I really love talks about perfect love casting out fear. So how do we ground ourselves in God's love? You know, we sing about, we're not afraid, God, God is with us, but it's easier to sing about that than to live it out sometimes. Yeah. Um, so a few practical ways I would say is to start with really spending some time in God's word, looking at what does God's word in the Bible say that might inform how we respond to this? We've talked about a few of those ideas, but we could go a lot deeper. So I'd start there, and then I would say there's lots of opportunities to engage locally. And we're blessed here in Chicagoland. We've got three offices of World Relief that's probably within a decent drive of just about any one of our campuses. Where there's opportunities, you could sign up and say, hey, I'd like to welcome a refugee family at the airport, or maybe my small group wants to work together and be what we call a good neighbor team, welcome a family, and really commit to befriending them over the first several months that they're in the country. Uh, I will say we have fewer arrive, refugees arriving right now than we used to because of some of the policy changes, um, but maybe there's other refugees who have been here for a little while who could still use some support. Maybe it's being a, an English language tutor or helping out in one of our English classes in, in Wheaton or in Aurora or helping out with a citizenship workshop, helping people who have been here a few years who are now eligible for citizenship to apply for that. And I think one of the things that that will do is it puts that human face on this issue. And for me that, you know, I'm not afraid at all of my refugee neighbors. Like that doesn't occur to me anymore, any more than I'm afraid of, you know, other good friends. Um, and then I the last thing I would say is just to keep in mind the global dynamic of this, because it's right and good for us to respond by loving our neighbors locally, but the vast majority of refugees are not in the United States, are not coming to the United States. And there's ways, and that's something we do at World Relief that we get you know, we, it's a privilege for us to come alongside churches in other parts of the world, in places like Jordan or Turkey, or in South Sudan or Kenya, and help them to respond to, frankly, the much larger number of displaced people who they're encountering as they do so in the name of Jesus. Um, and through all of that, to, you know, just to recognize that this is our opportunity to show the love of Christ, to love our neighbor in very tangible ways, and allow that to be our, our engine, rather than the fear that that is very natural for us to feel. Super grateful that we had had this time together, but also grateful to have you as a part of community. Yeah. So thank you very much for that. Um, you've a couple of resources I've already mentioned. You have Welcome the Stranger, which, which was um, I think a terrific kind of conversation uh, piece in this on this, and also then uh, Seeking the Refuge, which is, just came out. I'll tell you, what, I, would, I would love for you to just kind of I want to end with giving you the opportunity to give our church a challenge. On page ninety nine, yeah, uh, you write you write this, and then maybe you can kind of sure. use this as a stepping. Uh, getting off point for kind of a challenge here to wrap up, wrap up with. It says this, says, the plight of the refugees in our world today is, unpre is an unprecedented global crisis. For the church, though, it's also an unprecedented, unique moment to live out our theology. The refugees of the world, some of them persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ, other than, others of them, not yet followers of Jesus, are watching how the church will respond, whether guided by faith or by fear. You know, one of my favorite sort of pieces of biblical imagery is when Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew, uh, you are the light of the world. And when Jesus used that phrase, he wasn't talking about the United States of America. He wasn't talking about a public policy question. He was talking to the church. He was saying, you are the light of the world. Uh, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. And I think that's, in my mind, the, the moment that we have for the global church, including here in a community, including for the rest of this region, but for the whole world, Millions of people are going to make their mind up about Jesus based on how they see what they presume is a Christian country responding to this refugee crisis, whether that's here or in Europe or wherever, based on the individual interactions they have with self-professed Christ followers. And if what they perceive is this is love and hospitality and advocacy and welcome, they're going to be drawn to Jesus. If they experience fear and hostility or even just apathy, that's going to send them a different message. I think not an accurate message of who Jesus is. But 
how we respond to this, I think, can actually have incredible ramifications for the church for decades to come. And, and we can be a part of that locally at community, which I think is really an awesome place to start. You know, we can do this in our own communities while we also love and care for the rest of the world. Would you mind uh, just saying a prayer uh, yeah, for I'm our church and uh, as we kind of continue this conversation? God, we thank you that you loved us enough to send your only son um, to this world, uh, to leave the, the comforts of heaven, to be a foreigner in this world, even to live the life of a refugee as a small child because of your love for us. And I pray, God, that you would then give us the love that we need to overcome the fears that are, are pretty natural, to, to see that those fears cast out by your perfect love, and that that would be our motivation as we respond, and as our brothers and sisters throughout the world respond to a refugee crisis. I thank you, God, to be part of a church that's willing to engage in tough conversations, and I pray that you'd use this one. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thanks so much.